Hello. Who's here? Uh, I can't see anything. Oh yes I can. Oh hello, fabulous, there are people here. Sorry, I was putting some makeup on after the school run. And, oh, and now we can get started. Got that, I've got that. Uh, yes I've got that. I'm just going to blow my nose <laughs> and then we'll get going. nightmare because I've put a post up on my Facebook page saying that if you'd like to write a comment then I'll get it because there's no comments on YouTube but I'm using my phone uh, to, I'm pointing my phone at my computer so how on earth I'm gonna get those comments I don't know I won't I'll, I'll check my computer at the end I'll do the show and then and then we can banter at the end on Facebook comments if you like um, okay who's liked this that's very helpful oh yeah it's great that really pleases youtube when people like things okay right we're flipping let's do this <coughs> <coughs> oh dear <coughs> me ma, 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 ma. here we go <laughs> hello everybody it is i lara from Theatre of Science, with the weekly science show. That's been going on since lockdown, and it's, it's still going. So today, it's the physics of rainforests, all right? We've got a Lego story time about a very cool discovery. We've got an activity that some of you might have done before. Bring a bowl, washing up liquid, water, and some ground black pepper. You know what we're doing, but do you understand how it works? We'll look at how it works, and what it has to do with the rainforest. So, rainforests, right? A lot of us know what rainforests are. Rainforests are very wet and they're very warm, but there's not a lot of why rainforests are. So I thought, well, since a lot of you lot know a lot about rainforests and I'm a physics teacher, I'll do the why rainforests are and then everything you learn afterwards hopefully might make a bit more sense. Right, now, confession, I am a phys I've taught physics to A-level. I've just got this mental block when it comes to like, the seasons and how that it's just because the earth's turning but the earth's also going out and even the sun is turning but I think I've worked it out all right so why rainforests are bare why rainforests exist <clears throat> by Lara Stafford age 39 and a half geographers and scientists have drawn imaginary lines around the planet to help us work out where things are okay it's just easier if we know we're all talking about the same point if we can talk about where certain lines cross so we've drawn imaginary lines across the earth as you can see on my globe um, and they are called lines of latitude you heard of latitude it's just an, these imaginary lines going across the earth right and that help us figure out where stuff is and there are also lines of longitude which are these lines coming down so i don't know i have to remember lat is flat and the most famous line of latitude is the belt around the earth which is called the equator all right now pretend my head is the sun if the earth just went round the sun like this if the earth wasn't tilted then the equator would get all concentrated sun's rays and the rays would be very spread out across the poles and the equator would be very hot and everywhere else would be kind of cool luckily that is not what happens because the earth is on a tilt all right so if you imagine my hand is going 
my hands at like zero degrees, the earth is tilted like that, about, well, exactly, 23 and a half degrees. So because the earth is on a tilt, we have seasons, right? So there's a, the, the earth's going around the sun like this, and there's a point where the north of the planet is pointing towards the, the sun is pointing like directly more in the north of the planet. You get it? You see what I mean? So imagine that there's a sun ray coming from the sun. It's shining directly onto a point more north in the planet. And that's when it's summer in the north. And then the earth goes around the sun to the other side and it gets to this point and now the, the, the sun is shining like directly onto a point in the south and that's when it's summer in Australia and that, yeah? So this point where the earth, where the a sun's a, a ray of light traveling from the sun hitting this point dead on, we've drawn an imaginary line around that and we've called it the Tropic of Cancer. It's because uh, tropic, it turns out, means turning or like changing direction in Greek. And when 2000 years ago they were working this out, it turns out that where the sun was, it was also where the star constellation Cancer was. Yeah, you heard of the constellations, the Cancer one was where the sun was when they worked this out. When, so when, it's like the 21st of June, isn't it? When the sun, when the earth gets to this point on about the 21st of June and the sun's rays shine directly onto this point and it's then summertime in the north, um, this whole imaginary line around here where the point is, is Tropic of Cancer. Look, it's even written there on my globe. And then the other side, <clears throat> they do the same thing. It's about the 21st of December when the sun's rays are shining directly onto about this point here uh, below the equator in the south. They've drawn a line around that as well and that line is called the Tropic of Capricorn because same reasons Capricorn is a constellation of stars which just happened to be in the same place as the sky where the sun was when they named it 2000 years. It's not anymore. Now these are all just words that we have to remember but anyway that's why this bit is called the tropics. All the bit of the planet that lies between the line the Tropic of Cancer and the line, the Tropic of Capricorn, obviously including the equator, all that wedge, is called the tropics. It's actually, it's actually called the torrid zone, is its proper word. Uh, someone, when I was doing this show on Facebook the other day, looked it up and realised that torrid means hot and dry, which caused massive confusion because the torrid zone is obviously very wet because it's where the tropical rainforests are, but it turns out the Greeks named the torrid zone as well, and they just got that it was hot, all right? So this bit is the torrid zone, or we could call it the tropics, and it's where the tropical rainforests are, because tropic means turning, and the whole reason that it's hot is because it's always got a lot of concentrated sunlight shining on it. Woo! Okay, I did it. Right, now, why is the, why are the tropics wet? Well, that's easier. It's because um, warm air stores water more easily. It stores more water. So air particles all around us, in the air, right now. In the air, they are the air. There's air particles in the air. And when they get warm, they get more energy and they spread out and they can hold more water. So that's why the tropics are hot and it's why they are wet. Let's do the activity. All right, get a bowl, put some water in it, and then uh, we're gonna sprinkle some cracked black pepper on top. Then we're gonna dip our finger into washing up liquid and we're gonna see what happens. If you've never done this before, lucky you, because I think a lot of people a lot of people who were looking for stuff to do with household objects during lockdown, including me and everyone who was watching me, has done this already, but we're doing it again. Right. Um, so I've got some... I've got a bowl of water and another one in case something goes wrong. Yeah? Hashtag organised here. I'm going to put some cracked black pepper on top. You can use other things, but it doesn't tend to work as well. Thank you, people who are liking this video. Thank you. I like you too. There we go. And then you dip your finger into some washing up liquid, which which has just been here for a couple of days. <laughs> and then you put it in the middle and see what happens. What's gonna happen? Oh, I'm so excited. I hope, I hope this works. Oh, that was lame. <laughs> oh no, that's a bit better. That's a bit better. Maybe it helps if you actually squidge it right down onto the onto the bottom. That was all right, wasn't it? I'm gonna do that one more time. Maybe it helps if the bits of black pepper are really small. 
apparently we're now the kind of household that has a pestle and mortar so it probably works better if you're if you've got a pepper grinder right one more time and then i'll tell you why this is related to rainforest i'm pushing it down with a bit more force this time oh yeah that's pretty good isn't it that's pretty why does that happen and what does it have to do with rainforest well you can just fiddle now at home if you've got this activity in front of you while i tell you just having a cheeky little hand wash now uh, put it back well, what that has to do with rainforests is that were it not for that, you wouldn't have trees. So, water is sticky. How that works is, you, you know how magnets, when you put the same ends of the magnets together, the magnets push away from each other. But if you put opposite ends of magnets together, they stick together, yeah? Uh, atoms, the little particles that everything is made of, are the same. So, the atoms that are, make up water particles, just like every atom, have a positive particle in the middle of them, with negative particles whizzing around the outside. And positive and negative are just like magnets. They attract, opposites attract. So negative and negative push apart, positive and negative attracted. So water particles just happen to have one end that is a little bit more positive and one end that is a little bit more negative. So what happens is, um, it's just like magnets all joining together. When water particles get together, they form these little bonds. And the water particles right on the surface of the water, they're all bonded sideways quite strongly really, but because they, they haven't got any particles above them to bond to. And when you put your finger in the water, it feels, doesn't it, like you're pushing the pepper away. But what's actually happening is, it's kind of like if you imagine the really tight skin of a drum and you're stabbing your finger through a drum, um, the skin would sort of pull the tear apart, wouldn't it? Because there's still tension on the outside of the drum. So it's the same with the water. All the water particles uh, pull away from your finger and they pull the pepper along with it. So, trees in the Amazon rainforest reach tw uh, 88 metres high, like 20 double-decker buses. How does water get from the roots of a tree 88 metres into the sky? It's because of this stickiness. So, inside a tree is a little straw-type thing called a xylem, and water actually evaporates off the tree's leaves. It, well, it leaves the tree's leaves. So you know how, like, you might know that trees take in carbon dioxide and they give off oxygen. They also give off water. And it's to encourage water to come up through the big straw, the xylem that's in the middle of the tree. Because if you think about it, if water didn't leave the leaves, it would be like you trying to drink through a straw, but not swallowing any water. It'd just be the same water stuck in the tube. So water leaves the leaves of trees. And that makes like a little bit of space so that more water can come up from the roots. But if it weren't for this um, surface tension, this stickiness of water, I don't know, it'd just be like one water particle travelling up. But because water is sticky, one particle of water that goes into the roots, it brings all these little friends with it. So that's one way that that activity is related to the rainforest. Um, while we're on leaves, they can get really, really big in the rainforest. Have you noticed that? Rainforest leaves are massive, like bigger than people. Um, one of the reasons is because water needs to escape from leaves to cool them down. So you don't get huge leaves in the desert because the plant would get really, really hot and it doesn't have enough water to cool it down. It's just like a sweating. So in the rainforest, there's plenty of water available so the tree can sweat very, very nicely, keep itself cool so its leaves can get really big. It also has to do with um, uh, really big leaves. They can't, fr they're, they're more prone to freezing. Like if, you, if you're really big and it's frosty, it's very bad news for a tree. So in places where it's frosty, you can't have big leaves either, like places where it's cold. But the, in the, one of the definitions of the rainforest is that um, it's never frosty. So there you go. Right, how else this is related? I said we'd quickly talk about the basilisk lizard. Have you seen this? There's a David Attenborough documentary where the basilisk lizard runs on water. Um, I thought it was doing the same thing as our pond skaters do in the UK and just having like really big feet so that it can... Um, like spread its weight out. But it's not that at all actually. It turns out the basilisk lizard has just got incredibly powerful muscles and he's pushing down really hard on the water. So the reason that you can sit on a chair and not go through it is because you're pushing down on your chair but the chair is pushing back up on you. If you stand on water, you push down on the water, the water does not push back up on you. So you go through the water. But the basilisk lizard can push down so hard on the water makes a little air bubble and as long as it keeps running the water keeps pushing back with enough force that the lizard doesn't go through the water. Someone got an Ig Nobel Prize for working out how light humans would have to be 
in order to run on water. Our muscles aren't strong enough to push down on the water enough to walk on water. But if there was water on the moon, and there were humans on the moon, so we all weighed less, apparently it would be possible. I look, I look forward to that happening in our lifetimes. Um, right, very quickly, did you bring a pen that can balance on a table and a pen lid as well? We'll do one more thing and then we'll go to story time. So I want to tell you about this cool activity, uh, this cool discovery. Which I need that and oh yes, I could do with this as well. So get a pen and take the lid off. Which one of these, the pen or the lid, do you think will balance on the table more easily? Please do it at home. Get a lid and a pen, balance them both on the table. Which one will balance more easily? Why? Obviously you're saying the lid. We all know that a short little lid will balance much more easily than a pen, but why is that? Well, it has to do with center of mass. So get the pen and try and balance it on your finger. Where a, the center of mass of an object kind of means like, sort of on average where all its mass is concentrated. So mass sort of means all the stuff that a thing is made of. So all the particles that this pen is made of, like on average, a concentrate. It's hard to explain, but it's, it's very easy to demonstrate. The center of mass of a symmetrical thing is in the middle. So this pen is pretty much symmetrical, so you could balance it on the middle of your finger, yeah? That's what center of mass is. Do you, do you get it? I've done whole lessons on center of mass. <laughs> We won't go into it too much. <coughs> but the centre of mass of this lid, I've put a little bit of tape on it. Now, something is stable if the centre of mass of an object is over its base. So if you imagine that the centre of this bit of tape is the centre of mass of my lid, the base of the lid is the bit of the lid that's on the table. So here, the centre of mass, if we draw an imaginary line straight down from the centre of mass of the table, the pen is very stable. The centre of mass is definitely over the base. If I tilt the pen lid slightly, well, imagine our imaginary line now. It's going from the centre all the way down. It's still over the base, can you see? If you imagine there's just an imaginary line going from the centre of that bit of tape down to the table, the line would still be within the base. So if I let the lid go, it goes up, right? See, if the centre of mass is beyond the base, so here now, the centre of mass, that imaginary line is on the table and not not over the pen, then when I let go, it's going to fall. That's why things fall, is because their centre of mass goes over their base. So the centre of mass of this pen is much higher. So it doesn't take very much moving of the pen to put that centre of mass over the base, which is why tall things are far less stable. And that's why rainforest trees have buttress roots, these massive roots that start quite high up the trunk and then come down. Have you seen those? It, it's a weird fact that rainforest soil is not very nutritious at all. Like UK, we're used to talking about how soil is very nutritious, yeah? It's full of like worm poo and dead leaves and bacteria and all kinds of stuff that make the soil great. But in the rainforest, as soon as a nutrient lands on the forest floor, one of the many, many living things there goes, I am having that. So rainforest floor, hardly any nutrients in it. It's not worth a tree moving its roots into the soil. It's not really going to find anything. All the nutrients are right on the surface. So UK trees, uh, they've got a really wide base. They're very stable because they've spread their roots out under the ground. But rainforest trees, they don't want to spread their roots way down under the ground. So they start their roots high up. So their base is still wide, but it's visible. This is why high chairs and cafes are always getting tripped over because to stop the, if the little person's like thrashing around like this, if the legs of the high chair were straight, when the little person thrashed this way, their centre of mass would be beyond the legs and it would fall over. Whereas if the legs are like this on the high chair, the little person can thrash around, but they can't get their body over the side of the legs. You see what I mean? Right, that was a lot all at once. That's about five physics lessons in one go but I hope that helps. I think we should do story time. Let's do this. <laughs> Actually, I'm just gonna leave you here for a sec. I'll set up my computer, because I have some visual aids to help me with story time today. There we go. <clears throat> Come with me.
<coughs> You're in a new city. You desperately need to get to the Natural History Museum. What do you do? You use a map, of course. Maps are like coins or, I don't know, trains. We take them completely for granted, but someone somewhere has thought them through to make our lives better. A major breakthrough for maps happened in the 1100s when the king of Sicily, the Norman king, Roger II, asked scholar, mathematician, journalist, artist, awesome person, Al Idrisi, to map him the world. So Idrisi read books in all kinds of different languages and he, um, he interviewed many, many travellers about the things that they'd seen and the countries that they'd been to and he heard their fantastic tales and eventually he used all this information to craft a map onto a two metre wide silver disc. This map would be the main map of the world that we would use for the next 300 years. Now, top tip, if you've made something great and you want it to last through time, uh, don't put it on solid silver. Obviously, the silver map uh, disappeared at some point in history. But here is a reproduction. There you go. How great is that? So south is at the top because why not? The, the planet doesn't have an up or down. We just completely made that up. Um, but to, So this is the south. But to be a little bit self-indulgent, um, this bit in the corner, because most of us are in the UK, uh, this is Britain. So this little bit down here kind of looks like a gallbladder just above that straight line. That is Scotland. And this pointy bit here, which looks like a bird pecking at a sausage, uh, that's Cornwall. So there you go. This was the map of the Earth for 300 years. And then technology progressed and uh, the humans, they took pictures of the surface of the Earth using satellites and they scanned the oceans using uh, radar. And eventually Google stitched all that together and now we have oh, Google Earth a 3D map with more detail on it than anyone could have possibly imagined. So how are we using a Google, sorry, did I say Google map? I meant Google map is good, but this is Google Earth. Google Earth is phenomenal. How are we using Google Earth for good and not the obvious choice, which is evil? Well, Dr. Julian Bayliss was in his office. There. Dr. Julian Bayliss uh, was a conservation biologist working for Kew Gardens and the government of Malawi. Now he, his job is to look for places on earth that look like they're in need of protecting. So in 2005 he was working on Mount Mulanje in Malawi and he noticed that there were similar mountains in Mozambique just over the border that didn't seem to have anything written about them. So this is literally what he did. He went to Google Earth, he found the place where he was working, this is Mulanji Mountain, yeah, in Malawi, and he just, on Google Earth, he just went across to where he thought he'd seen these mountains, because, you know, he's a scientist, he knows that they're high enough up that he might find something very interesting there, and sure enough, this is what he found. He said, a dark green patch emerged. Now, obviously, the people living around Mount Mabu rainforest, they knew that the rainforest was there. In fact, the mo um, there'd been an absolutely horrific war and the locals had hidden in the rainforest. I feel bad that this story is skipping past that bit. Absolutely horrific war in Mozambique. There's still a lot of trouble there. But this rainforest was unknown to science. So it hadn't been uh, catalogued. None of the living things had been recorded. Um, and nobody had cut any of it down but Kew Gardens concluded that there was a strong chance that someone might cut it down so off went a team of scientists there were scientists from the UK exploring this rainforest uh, Mozambique Malawi Belgium 
Switzerland. Now it doesn't sound very romantic, does it? Cataloguing living things, but if you want to protect a place, finding new species is a really good way to uh, persuade people to protect it. And they did find new species. There was a pygmy chameleon, the three different kinds of snakes, uh, there were four new species of butterfly, and a bird that was very endangered everywhere else. Turns out it was doing absolutely fine on Mount Mabu. Um, and the, the government said, OK, we're going to try and stop illegal logging from happening in this rainforest. What a lovely, happy ending. But then we definitely found every rainforest, right? On the planet. Oh, no, not quite. This next bit is kind of even more amazing. In 2012, Dr. Bayliss spotted an old volcano on Google Earth with almost vertical sides. He says Mount Leco was isolated and appeared totally undisturbed. Now, unlike Mount Mabu, even the locals at Mount Leco said that they had absolutely no recollection of anyone having ever gone up it, and there weren't even any local legends about it. Um, so they sent a drone up. And it came back and said, yeah, looks like there's definitely a rainforest there. But how on earth were a bunch of scientists going to scale a 125 metre high mountain? Well, they would need a crack team of biologists. Hello. They got in a plant expert. They got in a fish expert. They got in butterfly experts and researchers. And of course... Uh, Dr. Bayliss also had to call in climbers. This guy's my new uh, favourite person. Mike Robertson once climbed uh, the Eiffel Tower, just on his own, just his idea, took up a banner to protest the treatment of people in Burma. What a legend. So he, with another climber, he scaled the pretty much vertical walled volcano and put in two ropes. In the end, Mike and his friend would climb up those ropes 40 times bringing supplies. Um, there were two ropes so that if one of the scientists was really, really nervous, then Mike could follow them on the other rope, like encouraging them all the way. Don't worry, you've got this. It's fine. I'm here. So lovely. Apparently the scientists were absolutely amazed at how patient and kind the climbers were. And the climbers were absolutely amazed at how much dedication these scientists who'd never done any climbing in their lives had. Uh, so the whole team says that where, by the time they got to the top, they were extremely tired, but they were also extremely emotional. Such an amazing moment. Apparently, they were instantly surrounded by butterflies as well. Absolutely loads of them. Um, Dr. Bailey says to the Verge website, it was an incredible sense of excitement. It was an incredible sense of a chick. Do you know what? I don't feel like Lego is going to cut it, actually. I feel like it's just not really got the grandeur that I was hoping for. I'll, I'll just take you to the Verge article. Here we are with the most fantastic photos. Look at that. So that's the mountain shrouded in cloud. That's where they actually went. <clears throat> Dr. Bailey said, it was an amazing sense of excitement. It was an amazing sense of wonder. Walking through the forest, looking, smelling, listening, hearing, looking in wonder at the undergrowth, looking in wonder at the trees, and seeing lots of small mammal tracks going across the ground, which is very exciting because that means they've got stuff up there, small mammals up there running about all over the place. And what they found, they reckon, is one of the most pristine rainforests on planet Earth. So many caterpillars in the trees that their droppings fell like a soft, dry rain. This is a paradise where butterfly baby poo falls from the sky. Here's someone climbing up the mountain says it was incredibly difficult and um, they also bizarrely found two pots at the source of one of the streams which suggests that someone had been there before but who uh, the locals have absolutely no idea but um natural history museum scientists from the mozambique natural history museum are investigating but if you think that you've discovered everything there is to discover about planet earth you'll have to think again and again and again and again the end. So there you go. I love that story. I love how um, that those people who, who grew up and trained to be butterfly experts and plant experts, you know, like, at, I mean, possibly people were taking the mick out of them at school, eh? And certainly no one was thinking eventually they would be one of only a handful of people to stand on top of an enormous volcano and look out and think, wow, 
barely, like hardly any, if any human has ever seen this before. Just amazing. You just never know where life's going to take you. All right. That is the end of the rainforest show. Um, <clears throat> I will tell you how I am doing this for free because there's a lot of people supporting me. I would not be able to carry on doing this. Lockdown, it was all right, wasn't it? I didn't have anything else to do, but I'd have to have a job now if it weren't for all the wonderful people supporting me. So if you would like to join them, you can go to my Facebook page, you can, um, or there's a link to coffee somewhere on YouTube, I think. Start, you click around on YouTube, you'll find this link to coffee, which is this website where you can pay me five or six quid a month. And I will send you nice things to say thank you. There's enough people coming that you can uh, get all the lessons for five, six quid a month. And I can send you thank yous and still have a job. So if you sign up now, I'll send you the pirate magazine. It's like the science of pirates. So there's a comic that my husband illustrates, which is all about... Are there any good pirates? Like, what's the best way to save the whales? Are this, is this organisation doing a great job or a horrible job? Try to write it so that you can decide. Um, did pirates have wooden legs? Like, wouldn't they've really chafed in those days? What were operations like? I will send you a free piece of string so that you can do this knot tying activity at the end. Um, there's activities that I can't do in the show for various reasons. Very proud of Theatre Science Magazine. So if you sign up now, I'll send you that. And I'll also send you some rainbow glasses that, I don't know, disappeared somewhere. Uh, and an explanation of how the rainbow glasses work. Because how things work makes them fun. So there you go. Thank you so much for everyone. Who has received my bundles of stuff to say thank you for supporting me. Yes, go to coffee and do that. I'd be very appreciative. Or like this video and stuff. That also massively helps. Okay, I'm going to go because over on my Facebook page at 11 o'clock, we are doing a home ed lesson about uh, igneous rocks. So I have to go and set up for that. I'm like a real teacher now. I get to dash around in between lessons. Thank you so much for coming. I'm going to go and see if anyone's commented on Facebook just before I go. But that is the end of the lesson. <laughs> so uh, if you haven't sent me a comment on Facebook, then feel free. Oh my goodness, it's only 10 past, it's only five past 10. Wow, I was really talking fast, eh? <laughs> oh no, we did cover quite a lot. In quite a short space of time, didn't we? Right, let's have a look. What have you said to me? Ah, yes, hello everyone. <laughs> All comments, let's have a look. Hey, someone else has liked this, thank you. Ah, hello darling, darling son six. I hope you came. <laughs> let's have a look, who else is here? Oh wow, I've got loads of time to set up. I should have chilled out a bit. I don't think I missed anything out. I think I was just talking at the speed of light. Good time for my computers to stop loading. To be fair to it, I do have a lot of tabs open. Let's sort that out. This is great telly, isn't it? This is where the this is where the entertainment really starts to happen. <laughs> Oh, it's not loading. I might just have to read your comments after the fact and then put a little thumbs up next to them. It's not the same though, is it? Come on, there's 17 comments. It's not letting me get to. I'll keep trying. I've got time if you've got time. <laughs> Seriously, did I get everything in? Why trays are so tall? Why they have big leaves? That was a bit rushed, but it is quite complicated. Uh, the fact that they sweat to stay cool. The basilisk lizard. Oh, I knew there was something. Um, well, because there's temperate rainforests as well. There are rainforests that aren't tropical that are further up or further down on the planet. Like there's um there's rainforests in Scotland. I did not know this. There's rainforests in Devon and Wales. There's, in Dartmoor, it's absolutely amazing. Um, here we go. Right, I'll try again. Yeah. The rainforest in Scotland, it's got 200 different kinds of moss and 200 different kinds of uh, lichen, which is my favourite stuff on the planet. Oh, here we go. Oh, no, when? It was, wait, it was Quinn and Paisley's first time. Ah, oh, that's so cool. Quinn and Paisley, if you're still here, then well done. That's very impressive. You've just got through your first watching Lara Google stuff <laughs> session. Amazing. All right. Hello, Quinn and Paisley. Oh, if you're home ed, you can come to home ed as well. I mean, you might have had enough screen time today, but you can come today if you like. Or the home ed lesson is live tomorrow on YouTube. So I could meet you here at half past ten. My cat Monty just meowed crazily after you said that is the end. 
Hmm, the theatre of science pets, we love them. Yeah, but is Monty upset or relieved? We just don't know. I have a few favourite rainforest animals, says Bella, which are Potu, Moki and Sloth. All right, wait, when you say Moki, do you mean, do you mean monkey? Or is there a creature called a Moki that I've never heard of? Oh, hello, Declan and Tristan. Oh, that's nice. No, wait, Declan and Tristan are new as well. Ah, that's amazing. Hello, Declan and Tristan, that's so cool. Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, it's so nice to see new people. So interesting about the volcano rainforest. Thank you. Oh, you're most welcome. Oh, no way. Helen sent me a whole video. I'll watch that after. Oh, no, I'll watch it now. How boring for you. Are you flicking the... Oh, no, you're explaining. There's a lot of hand gestures, and I thought maybe you were playing flick, washing up liquid into a, a bowl. We shouldn't, we shouldn't do that. Oh, yours worked really well. That's good. Oh, I love it. Um, um, Amir, Amir are here. Oh, that's good. Hello, Ira and Amir. Amir. Um, <clears throat> Amir. Hi, Amir. And Isla. And Amir. Hello. Bye, Declan and Tristan. Bye, Bella. And bye, Quinn and Paisley. Nice. All right, I am going to go and set up now. Also need to recharge the battery on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> See you both then. Thanks for all the support, you lot. Bye. <laughs> I think I need more.